It is no secret that I absolutely love astronomy. So much so that my degree, which I am yet to obtain for all the haters, is astronomy and planetary science. So there is no doubt that my specialist subject within science is the field of astronomy. So when I see a channel that tries to rewrite the rules and laws of astronomy, then I'm not best pleased. Hello all and welcome along to another episode of Tinfoil Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Yes, we are back today looking at YouTuber Jeffrey Walensky, who spends his time trying to teach people that there's always a better theory, apparently. Now, Jeffrey feels that planets and stars are actually the same objects. What do you think of that, Jaron? Interesting. Yes, interesting indeed. Come on then, Jeffrey, away you go. So I wasn't very clear in how I made the discovery to begin with about the fact that stars are young planets and planets are old stars. Stars are young planets and planets are old stars. Well, that'd be very difficult because generally stars are a lot older than planets. But please continue. Hi, Celeste. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I took geology back in 2004 at the University of Maryland the first time, um, well, the first time I went to the University of Maryland, I didn't realize that anything like this would ever occur to me. I, I learned about the Earth, its layers, the fact that when you go deeper and deeper and deeper, things get weird. And the center of the Earth is made up of a giant iron nickel alloy ball. It's pretty big. Um, it is indeed. No issue so far. Take note, Flat Earthers. And to sort of dramatize this discovery for people and to kind of clarify where their mind should actually be and where my mind is, we should do some math. I know, math. Nothing wrong with a bit of maths. Um, Earth iron, inner iron nickel core, uh, its radius is about 1,220 kilometers. And for those who don't remember, the radius is the halfway distance between the center to the, from the dead center of the of the of the sphere to the outer edge. So that's twelve hundred and twenty kilometers of distance right there. And the formula for a uh, volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. So you take four thirds times three point one four times the radius cubed. And 1,220 cubic kilometers is 1.85 billion kilometers. And then you multiply that by four thirds and 3.14159, whatever. And you come out with a volume of the inner core of the Earth as being 7.6 billion cubic kilometers of iron nickel alloy. And there's nothing wrong with his maths there. Sounds good so far. We're talking a hell of a lot of alloy. Iron nickel alloy. Okay. And how I made a discovery was I was looking at that Wikipedia page and I was looking at where it said this is an evolved star right before core collapse and it had the layers like an onion. For clarity here, when a massive star reaches the end of its life, the core of that star becomes hotter and hotter and hotter, allowing nuclear fusion to fuse together elements that are heavier and heavier and heavier. As this process continues, you get layers or shells of material that get heavier and heavier as you descend into the core of the star, leaving a nice solid ball of iron in the middle. And the very center was iron and I was like, core collapse, that's an evolved star. And then I was thinking to my geology class, I realized that Earth had a giant iron nickel alloy core too. And then boom, it clicked. I realized that Earth was an ancient star. That is a tremendous leap and a massively incorrect one. Let's start with the star, shall we? 
Now, the reason we get a iron core at the center of a high mass star at the end of its life is because the energy required to fuse those iron atoms together is greater than the amount of energy produced from the fusion that it would partake in. That's simple to grasp, yes? Now, when that star, that high mass star, eventually gives into gravity and goes supernova, the explosion results in that iron core and all the other metals that were surrounding it being blasted into the surrounding space. As new star systems and planets are formed from the remnants of these old dead stars, and the iron is the heaviest element there in any abundance, then it follows that iron will go on to make a large constituency of the planets that form. The process of planet formation means that over hundreds of millions of years, the heavier elements sink towards the core of the planet, iron being the most common one. Depending on how much iron is present in the material that goes on to form a planet will depend on the size of that planet's iron core. Mercury's core, for example, is 85% of its total volume. And the dead stars, they have iron nickel cores too, just like Mercury, Mars, Venus, you know, on and on. But that being said, the point of this argument, and I've gotten a few messages by people claiming, oh, well, other things don't match up. You mean like temperature, size, metallicity, color, density, for example? I have the trump card for this. This will be interesting. In outer space, there is nothing except for a star that can melt down 7.6 billion cubic kilometers of iron and form a giant ball. There's nothing in outer space that can do that except for a star. Stars are much hotter than that. The core of the Earth is hot for two reasons. Firstly, primordial heat. This is the heat that's left over from the creation of the planet 4.6 billion years ago. And secondly, from the radioactive decay of some of the materials in the Earth's crust. The Earth's core is cooling, just exceptionally slowly. Because that's exactly what the Earth is. It's, a, it's the remains of a very old star. Incorrect, because the remains of old stars have densities that are the stuff of nightmares. A white dwarf, for example, your average star remnant, has a density 200,000 times that of Earth. A teaspoon of material from that white dwarf would weigh as much as New York City. And there's a little graph here where I show what happens. The star is born and it expands and it cools and collapses on itself. But as it cools and collapses, it forms that iron nickel ball in the center that it collects from other smashed up remains of other dead stars. And it just collects it in the center. That's easy because the iron's heavy, it sinks to the center. And the star has the energy to melt it down and collect it. Oh yeah, easy as that. Forget the observational evidence that shows no such process. It just happens that way. It's a giant furnace. It's a gargantuan furnace that spends its whole evolution becoming what's called a planet. Huge coincidence then that eight other stars were in and around the sun. That wouldn't have been a gravitational mess at all. And that being said, you can't have a star spinning its whole evolution becoming what scientists call a planet and at the same time having stars the same age as a planet. Of course you can. There's stars forming right now out there. That means they are younger than the planet you're standing on. For instance, if the process of star evolution is planet formation, then these young objects up here can't be way over here. They have to be over here. And if you don't have these objects, and here's the kicker, this is what people seem to, this is what's lost upon them. The astronomers and scientists alike and a lot of, you know, trolls online and what have you. If you have, if you don't have these available, then these can't form at all. That is absolutely true, but not for the reasons you say. Planets form from the leftover material that surrounds the newly formed star. If you cut these out of the picture, these can't form. 
Yep, again, not why you think though. There's no way to form these. If you cut out the young planets from the equation, you have no mechanism to heat down, to, to melt down all that iron nickel alloy. And you also have no mechanism to collect it in the center, which is the star's huge gravitational field. It's as simple as that. Unless the astronomers can offer a mechanism to melt down, by my calculation, 7.6 billion cubic kilometers of iron nickel alloy. Here's a clue for you, Jeffrey. When a planet forms and the center of that planet starts to get crushed under the huge amount of material above it, then that starts to generate a little bit of friction. Coupled with the fact that these protoplanetary disks can have a high temperature to start with, then it's not really hard to figure out how iron can become molten. Without there being a star involved, I don't know what to say. Because it's just the facts are staring at them right in the face. There's no way to form a planet outside of it being star evolution itself. But you have no way to prove that other than your realization. And it's, it's really that simple. And that's why I have the sun as being very, very young. And all the arguments that say that the earth had to have been in orbit around the sun are kaput because of that, because of simple physics. There's nothing in the vacuum that can melt down all that iron nickel alloy except for a star. It's, 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 really, it's really simple to understand here. You keep saying it's really simple, perhaps too simple. You're not supplying any reasoning with evidence. Um, and basically, <laughs> that's it. That's how the discovery was made, is that, uh, I remember when I was a when I was a kid and I used to watch various shows on volcanoes and lava and stuff and like why is there lava? What is this all about? Why is there liquid rock in the center of the earth, you know? Why is it coming out? Well, the earth is still still cooling off. It's very late stages of the star's evolution. It's it hasn't completely solidified yet. Uh it's nowhere near Venus's age. And it's nowhere near, Venus is nowhere near Mercury's age. What? Where did you pluck that one from? I think I'm done here, Jeffrey. I mean, all this would be like me saying that tumble dryers are old washing machines because they've both got drums in them. You see the ridiculousness of your argument? Well, there we go. Another Tim Ford Tuesday done and dusted. And very nice to touch on astronomy. Love doing that one. Perhaps we can look at Jeffrey again one day. Who knows? Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, then please, please do like and subscribe. It'd be thoroughly appreciated. I've been Simon Dan. Have yourselves a cracking day and I'll see you all tomorrow for some more physics. See you then. <laughs>